Okay, microphone turned on again, people coming in from coffee. I've been a little drastic with time, but it's all for everybody's good, because otherwise we can go on forever. And I really would like you to enjoy also at the end, the screening of the Donna Haraway documentary after the reception, it's really worthwhile. So welcome back. It's been quite a great day so far. I want to really thank Adam Bly for running the uh, panel before about complex systems. It was quite enlightening. And now, as a very organic segue, we're going to move into long-term attitudes. As we said this morning, and I repeat it now because some of you might have come in in the meantime, or some of you might have joined us waking up on the other side of the world just recently, the goals of the 22nd Triennale are several, but there are three main goals that we really keep in mind. One is to give citizens some practical ideas of what they can do in their lives to improve the situation and to try and live in a more attuned way with nature, whatever nature is. We'll take the whole exhibition to think about that question. The second goal that we have is to inspire citizens to think of complexity, to think of themselves as part of a complex system, of many complex systems. And the third is to inspire citizens to think in the longer term, to try and think beyond one, two or three generations and instead to have a more almost era-like uh, kind of perspective. And that's why we are today at the end of the day thinking of long-term attitudes. Long-term attitudes are sometimes informed by previous attitudes, very often. It's not necessarily about thinking of the future, of being futuristic. It's just about being realistic uh, about the fact that even though we are usually living to 75, 80, 85, in some places like blue zones to 110, and in other places that are much more ravaged until maybe 45, still there are living beings on Earth that have long, lived for much longer than we have. And it would be wonderful, you know, before in Michael John's presentation there was that amazing slide that's been re repeated so many times in social media of the human being with the hand covered in green that was kind of like shaken by a little frog. Empathy is really what we are striving for. But, you know, we can empathize with beings that are similar to us it's physiologically or maybe time-wise. It's much harder to empathize with a sequoia tree, say, or with lichens that have been in the Atacama Desert for thousands of years. But still, that kind of long-term attitude is important for us to really be part of nature and to be part of the human species. So today, to talk about this, we're going to have some great speakers again. The first one is Stefano Boeri. You have met him very briefly today. He introduced the whole day because he is the president of the Triennale. But besides being the president of the Triennale, he's also a renowned architect that has been, for instance, uh, pioneering the vertical forests, those beautiful buildings that you can see if you go to the terrace, on the terrace of the Triennale, and um, a theoretician and a professor. And he's been thinking of this idea of integrating architecture into the scope of nature for a long time. After him, we're going to have Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. Daisy is an old friend, a great collaborator, and one of the pioneers of the field of biodesign and synthetic biology married with design. She has been working putting together scientists and designers for the longest time. She's almost an honorary citizen of Perth in Western Australia, where the first synthetic biology plus design lab was ever founded. And recently, she finished her PhD that was about better, the idea of better. And it's really interesting because one question she always asks is better for whom? And broken nature, is it broken according to whom? Similar to what Maholo also asked. Then we will have Elisa Pasquale. Elisa Pasquale is part of a, a studio folder, which is a wonderful architectural practice that also will be the practice that will design the 22nd Triennale together with Matilde Cassani. So it's quite great to have her here. But besides being designers of exhibitions, they're also great designers themselves. And they have uh, developed several projects, amongst them Italian Limes, that think about the geopolitical uh, time span 
understand of so much of human intervention. Last but not least, we'll have Jamer Hunt. And what can I say about Jamer? He's been really a partner in crime in so many projects. He's a, uh, officially, he's the vice provost for transdisciplinary programs at the Parsons New School, actually not anymore, Parsons at the New School in New York City. And he's also responsible for bringing together very diverse disciplines from anthropology and sociology and political sciences to design in all of its different permutations. But what is amazing about Jamer is that his way of thinking has a lucidity that I lack and that I always seek. And uh, I am just lucky to be able to be working with him. And then we will have a final treat that is going to be Lorenza Baroncelli that is going to moderate the conversation. Lorenza is an architect and an urban planner, and now he's, she's also the chief curator of the Triennale. She has a lot of different projects on, uh, uh, under her belt, on her belt. I could never remember where in the belt it goes, but she's really very knowledgeable when it comes to urban planning and urban initiatives. And uh, in her role as the chief curator of the Triennale, she will be the best to actually finish the day. But before I call Stefano on stage, we have two more of those little videos. One is by Gavin Schmidt, who is a meteorologist at NASA in the United States, and the second is by Oliver Morton from The Economist. So if you don't mind turning down the lights and showing the videos first, please. Thank you. Geoengineering and terraforming, words given to us by a physicist and a science fiction writer both denoting the fact that groups of humans coordinated through politics or through ideology or through economics might change the workings of a whole planetary system, reshape a planet. On the Earth, this is geoengineering, and one might argue that if you look at the biogeochemistry of this planet, let alone the climate, it has already begun, though not in the most purposeful of ways. Applied to another planet, the idea of terraforming suggests engineering it to be more like the Earth. The irony of this happening at the same time as we are making the Earth less like the Earth is not lost. But there are two other words that we need in order to put this debate into context. Ecopoiesis, coined by a Canadian biologist, and xenoforming, a word used by science fiction critics, though no one knows where it came from perhaps from beyond. Ecopoiesis is the making of a home, a planetary home, of redesigning something or allowing something's characteristics to emerge in a way that allows it to be more, but more in what way, than it now is. Xenoforming is to take the Earth and to make it strange, as opposed to taking the strange and making it the Earth. Geo and terra, words for the earth. Eco and xeno, words for the home and for the stranger. All planetary engineering partakes of some of this. The question is, how much of each? We can see the evidence for human impacts on the environment almost everywhere we look. But on very long time scales, these changes will disappear. The true long-term fingerprint of the Anthropocene is being sequestered in the oceans, in soils and ice. This fingerprint will exist because right now we are having an outsized and unsustainable impact. Curiously, our fingerprint will look a lot like other events that geologists today can see in the record events millions of years ago that left traces that are surprisingly and remarkably similar to the one that we are leaving. Can we rule out the possibility that those events, like our current episode, had an industrial civilization as the cause? This idea, the Silurian hypothesis, forces us to think bigger. Why do we assume that we are the first or the only? We have a choice. Do we leave an obvious record of a fast-growing and perhaps short-lived civilization, or do we minimize the impact we are having and allow time for our geologists and astronomers to find traces, perhaps, of those that have come before? Uh, 
Uh, thanks. So first of all, I really apologize if I have the time to follow all the uh, thoughts and uh, proposal this morning. What I'd love to to propose you now in 10 minutes is uh, a series of images that I think push us to think seriously to a different perspective on the relation between uh, architecture and nature, basically. So uh, we uh, know quite well how much uh, the idea of taming nature, of controlling nature, of conditioning nature is part of the long history of uh, our disciplines in different forms, with different profiles, and in different periods. Last but not least, also the idea of uh, the human organ as a kind of metaphor for built architecture, for uh, urbanism, uh, was uh, so important and so influential in a period of uh, our, our history. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, we should probably introduce uh, another kind of perspective on uh, this uh, dialectic between uh, uh, nature and uh, architecture. And uh, in order to do that, what I normally do is to go back to uh, this dialogue. 1972, Eindhoven, and uh, the guys who started to talk uh, are probably one, two of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. Noam Chomsky on the right and uh, Michel Foucault on the left. Uh, the, the issue, the topic of the dialogue is the concept of human nature. And, uh, well, uh, Chomsky starts to describe the uh, concept of human nature, trying to work on the dialectic between culture and nature. And uh, what Chomsky starts to do is, uh, sorry, it's uh, an attempt to, uh, don't work. Could you please let me? Okay, thank you. Uh, Chomsky is uh, uh, trying to uh, describe the differences in which uh, the, um, the cultural uh, process of control of natural environment has changed that paradigm along the history. And Foucault is, uh, from his point of view, uh, introducing a totally different perspective. What Foucault does, uh, speaking French, where everybody is speaking English, and uh, with a very, very rough and hard intervention, it's uh, the invitation to consider that nature is not something which stay outside us. Uh, what Foucault it's uh, uh, proposing in this dialogue is a different concept of the idea of nature, which is so close to, uh, in the same period, Foucault was studying in order to define better the history of madness. Nature is not part, is not uh, the other side of the cultural sphere. Nature is part of the human sphere. Nature, it's every phenomena which is making us losing the control of uh, our body and of our mind. So the emergence of a natural phenomena is not something that we can describe, observe, or represent with something which is outside the sphere of uh, uh, the anthropologization and the field of cultural processes. Well, I think that uh, this point of view on the concept of nature, uh, which in a certain way makes nature so close to uh, other uh, phenomena which have been uh, studied and observed by the discipline of architecture and urban is very important. This is a satiricum by, by Federico Fellini. It's an amazing, probably one of the masterpieces of Fellini. And you probably remember there's a part of the satiricum which is uh, the, the earthquake appears, and the description of the earthquake with something which starts and appears from uh, exactly the soil, the ground where we are used to live, 
Earthquake is not like a, a, a typhoon or a tsunami. Earthquake comes exactly from the place where I used to experience your uh, personal and familiar relation. Earthquake is like madness. It's a process that are changing your life in few seconds, changes his centuries of history, decades of uh, human relation in a few seconds. And uh, this uh, sudden and unpredictable emergency of an insane, uncontrolled state of mind makes madness, earthquake, and what we could start to describe as a natural process so close. So I think that this perspective on a uh, different kind of idea of nature, it's in a way extremely fertile. It's fertile also when we uh, talk about the process of reconstruction. Uh, I've been recently involved in uh, some projects related to the earthquake that happened in Italy uh, two years ago. And uh, honestly, I have uh, received an amazing confirm of how the Foucault thought it's uh, absolutely uh, real and uh, capable to describe the reality. Because, uh, for instance, if you simply observe the reaction of the people, of the family, relatives, the victim of the earthquake, you observe and you can describe two main uh, reactions. The first is uh, uh, the abandonment. So people, families, feel themselves betrayed by the land where they spend their life, and they prefer to cut any kind of possible relation with that place. So it's not a segregation, like it happens with the fools in the history of madness by Foucault, but the process is the same. Thousands of people were abandoning forever that place, and they will never come back. The other reaction is the idea of removing the event, removing the madness of the territory, removing that sudden catastrophe who happened in a moment where you have lost the control of your own place. And there's the movie process of remotion, which is connected with the idea of building what we are used to see, where it was, how it was, I repeat, where it was, how it was, in a kind of way it's a, so similar to what happens to the different attempt to control the emergency of state of madness in the human, in the human mind. So uh, I think that this kind of uh, uh, thoughts could help us, could help us to uh, reintroduce in the concept of nature, a lot of phenomena that we are, uh, we are used to, con to consider uh, like a part of, uh, let me say, uh, uncontrolled process that from another point of view could be and should be probably considered like uh, uh, examples of the emergency of a kind of new naturalness in the sphere of uh, the urban condition. Uh, one is connected with uh, favelas. Uh, with Lorenza, we have developed a survey uh, some years ago on the Sao Paulo favelas, and probably one of the result of this uh, survey was exactly that. So the idea to go back to try to observe the emergency of a different a kind of parallel life in the contemporary urban condition, which something was so many possible analogies with the state of nature. Uh, another one is uh, for sure connected with, uh, let me say, botanic nature. And I think that uh, Gilles Clément and the idea of the trans landscape, uh, the idea of wilderness inside our urban environment, it's uh, uh, in a certain way a possible, uh, another, a second possible way to then of that. The third, I'm sure is something that you have started to observe in this your thoughts, it's uh, related to a kind of uh, uh, new condition of deal between our and the other species inside the urban environment. And, uh, uh, well, I, I, I really think that this is a, such an important issue nowadays. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, let me say, clues of something that has changed. 
and uh, we had to consider with, uh, with attention. Uh, we, together with Azura, we have developed with the Polytechnic in the last years, work connected with a different relation between our and different uh, species in, the, in, the, in Milano, and, and Animal City, this is a, where we are now, so the idea that uh, we created a kind of new environment, natural environment for wilderness inside the, the dense city of Milano. And just to conclude, uh, I think it could help us to, to rethink also to some of the most uh, uncontrolled phenomena related with the urban condition all over the world. Uh, this is a, you know, probably it's a fear of the walking dead. It's a, it's a TV series and that's here it's, con it's, con it's uh, showing the uh, phenomenon of riots in down downtown Los Angeles and uh, where, where the rioters are uh, mixed with the zombies and this phenomenon of, uh, of uh, totally uh, change of state of uh, the center of LA taking fire and so on, it's con I think one of the most powerful example of representation that there are. Another thing that you probably know that was published in Domus in 2004, it's a occupation of the uh, jail in uh, Buenos Aires, Casero Jail, where for uh, six years the prisoners were started to introduce a kind of parallel life inside the building, creating something which was completely uncontrolled. Under, for the loss of control of, uh, uh, let me say, urban land rationality and uh, the capacity of uh, kind of literature to emerge from that point of view. So I think that we have done our best to introduce living nature uh, inside the paradigm of control, and uh, we should probably start to uh, open a kind of different perspective on living, on living nature, which is uh, the idea that uh, living nature is not simply connected with addition of uh, green subjects, with addition of uh, botanic and natural uh, individuals or uh, landscapes, but has to deal also with something which is strongly connected with our soul and our uh, capacity to deal with uh, uh, the different perspective of our intelligence. Thank you so much. and to the Junali team. It's really wonderful to be here addressing these questions with you, to which I have, as always, no answers, but I will add more questions to the soup instead. And the first is this idea about design. Um, I'm still mystified what it is. And Herbert Simon had a very nice definition, which is to devise courses of action at changing existing situations to preferred ones. This idea that we project ourselves into the future to imagine how it could be otherwise. Or we could say it another way, it's a form of speculation, or indeed we are dissatisfied animals and we are dreaming of better futures. And I'm fascinated by this idea of better because it's being used now to sell us everything from pizzas to chemicals to rival political ideologies and I'm not quite sure what it means. So it's a kind of progress, a modern version of it. It's a social imaginary, a shared fiction with material results. But it's different to progress or the myth of progress because progress promises to uplift all of humanity and better is something else. Better is not the same as good. Better is contingent, it depends on people and places, and better for some can be much worse for others. So in my work, I spend my time asking what is better, who's better, and who gets to decide in design and in synthetic biology, a new field of genetic engineering where I've spent lots of time over the last few years. And I think another problem that we face is the challenge of this. So, this situates us on a path going forward, and there's one path. We're looking into the future from a singular vantage point, and to me it gives us no agency in the present to actually change things. And I'm more interested in, in this, this kind of complex terrain, because dreams of better futures and dreams of better paths affect the choices we make in the present. So just think of Make America Great Again, that's a, an example of this. And we all exist in multiple parallel realities. My better is different to yours, it may be different tomorrow. So how do we start to actually accommodate all those different spaces? 
I'm interested in how we can think of this as a complex terrain that we start to kind of navigate using design and potentially generate new possibilities. And a good example of this um, is my favorite science experiment. This is Richard Lensky, and he has been doing this amazing thing since 1988, where he took one sample of E. coli and separated it into 12 different flasks. And over 30 years and more than 65,000 generations, he's been tracking the evolution of these different populations. So 12 populations, 12 worlds exist simultaneously, each with their own battles and divergences and sort of different um, kind of storylines. And I find this really inspiring because you see how multiple possibilities can emerge in different ways. And I think it offers a model for us to think about, instead of, as we talked earlier about utopias and dystopias, to think about heterotopias. So what Foucault described as places that are different, they're not better or worse, but they're somehow other. So for me, the space that I want to kind of delve into is a place where we um, can reflect on the present, where we can explore and generate new possibilities and ultimately disturb the present path. So I'm going to talk about two projects which do this in different ways, one from the perspective of the future and one from the perspective of the past. So this um, was an amazing conference that I was very lucky to get to go to in 2013. And conservationists and synthetic biologists came together for the first time to talk about whether they had anything in common. And these are not two groups you'd normally see in a room together. And it was a very interesting discussion. And I was really struck by their radically different ideas of what was, of what was better for biology. So the conservationists are looking backwards, trying to stop human influence um, and preserve existing biodiversity and are quite pessimistic. And meanwhile, the synthetic biologists are kind of looking forwards and trying to invent new biodiversity for the benefit of that same humanity. So there's a problem here. And one of the things that came up was this discussion about whether anything could be done about this, the sixth extinction. Could synthetic biology potentially invent new forms of biodiversity to infect nature, to save it? For example, modifying coral so that it could withstand warmer waters and actually kind of spread genetically engineered things into the sea. And I was fascinated by this because um, I was wondering how would this be organized and who would get to decide and what would the wilds look like in this synthetic biological future? So this project, Designing for the Sixth Extinction, was a way for me to imagine this possible world and to explore the values at stake. Um, so in the gallery, you see kind of images and models and timeline, um, which I'll go through. So in the main image, there is this sort of perfect, almost sort of pristine, biodiverse forest. And as you start to look closer, you start to see some strange things sort of lurking in the undergrowth. And in this fiction, these are designed companion species that have been released simply to preserve other organisms. They are um, just devices to roam around and, and do a job. I like to explore ideas through the language of design. So I um, wrote about these just as machines and through the instrumental language of patent applications. So this is the self-inflating antipathogenic membrane pump, a kind of mushroom that would be designed to um, stop a very real disease called sudden oak death. The mushroom would inflate and pump serum into the tree. Now, this is entirely fictional, but it, there are real things in here which tether it to reality and make it recognizable to synthetic biologists. So I would talk about a six-base DNA system. At the moment, DNA is A, T, C, and G. That's the code that we operate on. And scientists are developing new codes. And one of the ideas behind this is that it could be safer for release into the environment, whatever we mean by safe. This is the mobile bioremediation unit, a kind of slug that would neutralize acidic soils. So in this project, I built a world kind of extrapolating from existing trends in ecology and ecosystem, not to try and um, make a sort of prediction or to say it's good or bad, but rather to explore the kinds of values that would shape a future like this. What would it mean if a corporation was commissioning the preservation of nature? What does it mean if we industrialize nature completely? Does it still exist for us to save? 
Now, what's interesting and enjoyable for me in my work is I spend a lot of time talking to scientists and present my work back to them, and it evolves in its own way. So I was really thrilled when it ended up on the cover of Fungal Genetics and Biology, my favorite science journal. Um, I hadn't read it before. Um, and the editors used the project as a way to ask their readers what they should or shouldn't design as they begin to engineer fungus. So a future fiction has the potential to disturb the path of the present. Another example has ended up as office art in Ginkgo Bioworks in Boston. Ginkgo is a biotech company where they have an organism foundry. They design and build organisms, microbial ones, for commercial and military clients at the moment. So this is potentially a generative but also problematic space for it to be, for it to be in, and I find that kind of interesting and juicy for the future. So I'm now working on a project with Ginkgo Bioworks with Christina Agapakis and Cecil Tolas, who is a smell artist. And in this project, we're using the perspective of the past instead to try and disturb the future. So Michael John did a wonderful job explaining de-extinction, so I don't have to tell you about the rhinos and mammoths that are going to be coming back to life. But um, it's a really problematic way to think about extinction. Um, Ginkgo are kind of interested in a different way. So they have gone to sequence tissue from extinct plant specimens in the Harvard University herbarium. So this is one of those species. But they're not trying to de-extinct these plants. Um, what we're doing is they're working with paleogeneticists to try and identify the smell molecules that these plants would have made. And then we can begin to speculate on how their flowers might have smelled. And I find this really fascinating because, and again, it's a lot of the themes that have come up today, is that these landscapes, the four specimens that we're focusing on, they um, are all landscapes that are lost as well. So these specimens, these species went extinct because of human activity, cattle ranching, vineyard expansion. So the plants are lost, the landscapes are lost, and crucially, the interaction between the two is lost. So you could resurrect the plant in theory, but what does it matter without the landscape? And does nature care anyway? Does it matter that it's lost? Um, for me, this whole kind of learning about this project and getting involved gives me this kind of sense of sort of deep unease, but also of awe. Awe at nature, its contingency, and human domination over it. And that sounds a lot like the philosophical idea of the sublime. So here's an example of a representation of the sublime from the 19th century. And I think that's what's kind of really interesting. Rather than using these kinds of technologies for de-extinction, can we use it to think about how we generate different kinds of experiences and sensations? So in this particular case, I want to generate a feeling of loss. And I think that sort of goes back to this empathy conversation. So can, we are working on designing an installation, an immersive space, where you would um, approximate this lost landscape. And going into this space, you would experience a very fleeting glimpse but just a sense of what this place might have been like, and then it's gone. So it's a very individual experience. And I'm really curious, as we all are in, this, in the project team, about thinking about what do these new kinds of technologies and spaces <coughs> afford us. Crucially, you know, these plants went extinct because of human dreams of better. Capital extinguished them, and capital plays a role in this sort of partial resurrection. And that's complicated. But I think it's fascinating for me, because I've never worked with genetic engineering before. My work has always been around kind of commentary on the ethics of it, to actually engage in, in designing organisms that allow us to reach back into the past and to help us, um, you know, using organisms to help us humans think about the present and future choices we make, and the kinds of ways that they could help us negotiate a new relationship with nature. So I sort of talked a bit about this dream of better, which is my pet subject. Um, but it is a kind of, for me, it really it sort of em is emblematic of why we design. We try to make things better, but we don't spend enough time thinking about what we mean by better. And I'm interested in sort of thinking about this linear progress, thinking about this more complex inter interplay between pasts and futures and presents, and the contingency and multiplicity of our own experiences in that. So how do we use design to kind of generate this new kind of heterotopian spaces where, where you know, the, the difficulties and frictions rub up against each other? And how do we use them to imagine other possible worlds and ultimately make them more possible? Thank you.
Okay, first of all, I want to thank you, Paula, and everybody for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm uh, Elisa Pasquale, as uh, you saw in the slide before. Um, I'm a design and designer and the founding partner uh, of Studio Folder, together with Marco Ferrari. Um, we are a small design studio based uh, here in Milan, and uh, we work across different media between research and commission projects, uh, of which the outcomes are physical installations, uh, exhibition, online visualization, or editorial projects. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our most important and longest project, Italian Limes, linking it to the research interest of my PhD in uh, its connection with borders, uh, nation states, and climate change. Italian Limes is um, an ongoing research project that, uh, um, and uh, an, an interactive uh, installation that explores the most remote uh, alpine regions, where national borders drift due to global warming and shrinking glaciers. Originally commissioned as part of the 14th International Architecture Biennale in Venice, the project focuses on the effects of climate change on shrinking glaciers and the consequent shift of the watershed that defines the national borders of Italy, Austria, Switzerland and France. Investigating the fragile balance of the alpine ecosystem, Italian Limes shows how natural frontiers are subject to the complex complexity and continuous ecological processes. The research uh, started from discovery then, uh, that uh, in 2008, the Italian parliament proclaimed a new law defining the border as mobile. The borders um, measured across the glaciers are moving because the ice is melting and the watershed lines are moving accordingly. The case study we consider is the one uh, of, the, of, of the border between uh, Italy and Austria, as you can see here in this picture. In this uh, case study, the border uh, moves consistently uh, as you can see, the red line is the newly measured border, while the yellow one is uh, the old border. Borders and their physical demarcations are maintained by the National Geographic Agency with expeditions that were increased to be every two years after this new law um, of the mobile border, even in in uh, remote uh, places, as you can see here in these pictures. So what we did in the project was to build uh, some sensor, sensors we developed uh, using open source technologies, and we installed them on the glacier following a grid with an extension of approximately one uh, square kilometer. Here you can see some pictures of the exhibition just to give you uh, the idea of uh, the space and the, um, and the place we encountered there and the scale of the sensors compared to the landscape. So they are quite invisible. These sensors uh, were registering their position and sending uh, it to a physical installation we made inside the Arsenal in uh, Venice, uh, in which visitors uh, could activate a drawing machine we built in order to draw the borderline in the exact position the sensor were registering it. At the moment, uh, the person asked for its representation on the map. Together with the drawing machine, there were also a display of some documents showing the history of the border and a physical model with a projection showing the territory and the transition of the borderline. But uh, thinking further upon borders, we were willing to understand how we moved from this 
a traditional crossing, border crossing between uh, European nation states before the signing of the Schengen Agreements in 1995. To this, which is an alpine border crossing between Italy and Austria and reflects our contemporary perception of privileged European travelers. National borders are something from the past that is basically gone, just looking at this picture. But is it really like this? Are these borders really disappeared? Or is it just a perception emphasized by the constant rhetoric of globalization? We are indeed in a moment in which international borders are, uh, and the demarcation of national countries are more important than ever before. One of the question, questions of this symposium poses is how long do national borders last? Taking a look to other disciplines, such as the one of nation branding, that was one chapter, one part of my PhD research about uh, states' communication after the 90s, it's more than evident that, that borders tell us who is divided from whom by political geography. And as long as countries will compete one against the other in a global market, market borders will be necessary. Indeed, in a global competition for investment, tourism and export, the idea of nation branding continues to attract strong interest inside governments. Here we can see a map of the extension of the phenomena of nation and destination branding in the 21st century. In the frame, framework of competitiveness, countries are considered like a brand since they have a reputation that determines its success in the international domain. Tourism, among other points that we can see here in the nation branding hexagon, um, is one of the points through which a government can build its own reputation. There are many examples of countries that promoted the idea of the nation using the natural landscape as the main resource to attract visitors. Here, for example, you can see New Zealand or Slovenia with their claims, I feel Slovenia, uh, or Wales in which uh, you um, are asked to find your epic. Even if there are good examples of uh, ecotourism's potential role in sustainable development, the commodification of the idea of nature related to tourism caused also severe damages to the environment. As just one example, tourism in national parks uh, is a growing trend causing many problems like solid waste and littering, air pollution and noise, or land degradation. The central fact of the, age, of the age we live in is that every country, every market, every medium of communication, every natural resource is connected. So, if we start considering that borders aren't natural, but artificially built to promote single country's interests, despite the damage they might cause to nature, to other countries or populations, the real question we might pose ourselves is, how long do we want national borders to last? Of course, it's a very naive question because we do need a form of government. But what I would like to question here is um, the, ne the necessity of thinking beyond borders because nature doesn't care about them and they are important just for humans. Thank you. That's my mother calling. <laughs> my
My name is Broken Nature. My talk's called Public Symposium. Um, apparently, I didn't get an icon. Um, I'm icon free. It's an icon free zone. There we go. I have a piece of corn. Um, I have nothing to say. I mean, literally. There's been so much said today that is so amazing. I have almost really nothing to add, uh, except maybe I could connect some dots. Uh, I could try and find a way um, to put into some context some of the things we've seen, but they're extraordinary presentations. And what I will do instead, uh, first of all, is to thank the organizers, Paola, Ala, Laura, Laura, Azura, um, this was impeccably organized, and uh, I'm so happy that you were also able to prototype what a uh, female-led world will look like. Um, I am very deeply humbled at this opportunity. I am mildly panicked because of the quality of my colleagues, and I'm absolutely inspired by what they've done. Paola invited me and the organizers to talk about time, duration, and design. Um, this has nothing to do with what I usually work on, uh, so this was a bit of a challenge. They gave me 10 minutes, so I came up with 10 provocations and no pictures. Um, and so what will emerge, hopefully, is a kind of strange taxonomy, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so what I'm going to start with, and it actually builds really beautifully upon the previous presentation, uh, is a project that was um, created by Heather Anderson, who's an anthropology graduate student at the New School, where I work, um, and working with uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby as their instructors in a course that I helped to set up. Um, she imagined a fictive country um, called Termina, and what distinguishes Termina is the way in which it understands its future. Um, she writes, quote, my project asks, what might we learn from a constitution that privileges some generations yet burdens others, that repudiates narratives of progress and redemption, that preserves ecology and peace through individual constraint, and that outlasts the very people to which it refers. And so what she does is actually she designs a constitution. She has a fascination with constitution and a background in law, and which in and of itself is a really interesting design uh, sort of gesture or, or uh, tactic. Um, she's really picking up on the kind of um, design of the immaterial infrastructure for complex systems, of the movement away from objects towards systems. And in that constitution, what she describes as a way of winding down the country different notion of the future. And she writes in the preamble, quote, we, the people who inhabit the territory, depicted on ancient maps as Tasmania, in order to ensure environmental justice and secure domestic peace, do establish this constitution for the new nation of Termina. With this constitution, we inaugurate the end of human life on this planet. In light of the irreversible depletion of natural resources, uh, and growing civil unrest, we commit to end our nation in three generational cycles after this constitution comes into force. We wish to promote harmony, dignity, security, and certainty in the years remaining to humans. Let this constitution be our last political compact and our lasting moment. And so in thinking about broken nature and thinking about this presentation, thinking about this uh, exhibition, what was interesting to me about this project was the way in which it imagined a future, not of more and more, but a future of designing ourselves out of the picture, of decentering the human uh, from the story. And so this goes along, I think, in many ways with um, what uh, is something that I keep worrying about. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, certainly in a lot of the presentations today we've seen this, which is this, the sort of um, recolonization of the future by design and by industries influenced by design. So whether it's financial industries, whether it's medical industries, all of these industries are suddenly uh, birthing small enterprises that are exploring futures. Um, and I worry about that. I feel like we're in a moment uh, where design in particular is trying to reassert its claim on a territory called the future. And, you know, somewhere located between dystopia and utopia, uh, we're making these claims on a kind of territory, a temporal territory. But the question I would ask is, are we prepared as designers, are we prepared to um, produce a kind of design that is accountable, that is diverse, that is plural? Who is making these claims on this temporal territory, and whose interests are these claims actually serving? The nice thing about all of this is that at the same time we're seeing this kind of um, recolonization of the future by design, we're also seeing designers who are decolonizing design. Um, and I'm thinking of people like um, Dory Tunstall or Mahmoud Kechavars. Um, and what they're doing is to decenter the human subject uh, 
in the Western human subject from the practice of design and to challenge the presuppositions of science, of mechanization, um, that imply a relationship not just to the kind of the self and uh, human to nature, but also the self to the other, um, and to the other as a human resource to extract and exploit. And so um, we did a project, uh, we're working on a project right now that's also decolonizing design in a certain sense, which is we're working with uh, Sciences Po, uh, University in France, and with Bruno Latour and Frédéric Etoiti on a project called Occupy Earth. And in this sense, we're, uh, we're, we're decolonizing design in, in the sense of trying to move the human out of the center and understand, can we imagine political processes where the voices of the non-humans are part of those processes? Can we decenter the human from design, from human-centered design? And Tony Fry, of course, the philosopher, talks about design as an act of defuturing, not just as future making, but of defuturing. That each act that we do of design not only produces a possible future, but it removes other possible futures from our horizon of possibilities. And it not only removes them as concepts, but it removes them in the sense that every building that we build, every car that we design and manufacture is itself a, a, an artifact that we will have to nurture and sustain over many years when we couldn't be doing better versions of those things. Sorry to say better, Daisy. Um, so what is the opportunity cost when we design? What are we taking out of our future when we design? So two examples of um, design that thinks about time in different ways. Um, both date from around the year 2000, both in response to kind of um, thinking about uh, uh, long-term futures. The first is the clock of the long now. Um, and uh, this was a clock that was intended to ring every uh, 1,000 years for a total of 10,000 years. It was conceived, financed, and built by Danny Hillis, Stuart Brand, Brian Eno, Jeff Bezos, in other words, the Silicon Valley Cognoscenti. Um, it was supposed to last 10,000 years, ring every 1,000 years. Um, it was uh, to be built. It was... Uh, dug into a mountain uh, in Texas, um, and it was this giant kind of uh, engineering colossus. Um, but let's just think about uh, who's represented in this notion of the long now. Um, of the 17 members on the board, 13 of those members are male. Only one is non-Western or of non-white descent. Um, they had a podcast that went along with this series. 36 out of the first 38 interviewed were male. Um, this digging through this tunnel, this erecting of this colossus. Um, this is one notion of time. This is not the only notion of time. And so while we think of time as a natural process, and in some ways perhaps it is, time is also a constructed process. It's a process that has a human dimension to it. And our notion of time in the West is not the same as everyone's notion of time around the world. So how do we bring those notions of time back into a project where 1,000 years and 10,000 years may be a meaningless unit of time? Another example um, uh, from that same time, the New York Times on, uh, 2000, on uh, January 1 of 2000 um, sealed up for 1,000 years something they called the Times Capsule. Um, this was this kind of beautiful organic steel form that was designed by uh, Santiago Calatrava, who won a competition. Um, and it was meant to, to be opened in the year 3000. Okay? Um, it was stored, it now sits at the Museum of Natural History. And again, we have to ask the question, what's natural uh, about a 1,000-year-old time capsule? There's nothing natural about that. Why is that at a natural history museum and not, say, an unnatural history museum? or an engineering museum. But what was really fascinating about that project, and what I really liked about it, um, was that uh, there were real questions about what lasts a 1,000 years. Buildings don't last a 1,000 years. Institutions don't last a 1,000 years. Museums don't last a 1,000 years. Languages don't last a 1,000 years. Nation states don't last a 1,000 years. Monuments don't last a 1,000 years, usually. Anything digital barely lasts 20 years. And even locations don't last uh, a thousand years. And one of the reasons we know that is um, in the 20th century, there are estimated to be about 10,000 time capsules buried underground. The majority of those were lost. So we can't even keep track of a time capsule for 40 years, and we think we're going to somehow move into the realm of 10,000 years. So what I want to do in sort of closing is to get back to the title of this, The Impossibility of Thinking That. So 
when conceiving and, and exploring this notion of broken nature and, and the kind of mind shift that's going to be necessary in an exhibition like this to truly move us beyond an anthropocentric notion of time, an anthropocentric notion of nature, um, I was reminded of a brilliant passage. And um, here's the third name check on Michel Foucault in just this panel alone. Um, not sure how that happened. So I want to read to you, um, I'm going to end with a bedtime story. Um, I want to read to you a passage from Michel Foucault's uh, book, The Order of Things, uh, Les Mots et les Choses, and I, I'll just read it. Um, so the book first arose out of a passage in Borges, out of the laughter that shattered as I read the passage, all the familiar landmarks of my thought, breaking up all the ordered surfaces and all the planes with which we are accustomed to tame the wild profusion of existing things, and continuing long afterwards to disturb and threaten with collapse our age-old distinction between the same and the other. The passage quotes a certain Chinese encyclopedia in which it is written that, so here Foucault is now um, citing a passage from Borges, and in that Chinese encyclopedia it describes animals that are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, C, tame, D, suckling pigs, E, sirens, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in the present classification, I, frenzied, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, L, etc., M, having just broken the water pitcher, and N, that from a long way off look like flies. And Foucault goes on to write, in the wonderment of this taxonomy, the thing we apprehend in one great leap, the thing that, by means of the fable, is demonstrated as the exotic charm of another system of thought, is the limitation of our own, the stark impossibility of thinking that. And that, to me, is the challenge of broken nature, is the stark impossibility of thinking that. How do we move beyond our own anthropocentric, design-centric world to include all those other species that we talked about today who are equally invested in this same ecosystem? And I'm reminded as well, if you remember, of two words at the beginning from Foucault, um, laughter and shattered. Um, I think if broken nature can provoke two things, it is both a shattering of our frames of understanding of the world around us, as well as the laughter that comes from that shattering. And I'm reminded of Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, um, who suggested that one of the only ways to counter the legitimacy of power was through laughter. And so the poetics with the pragmatics, the laughter with the shattering, a kind of uh, critical, uh, poetics, that's the world that I hope broken nature can evolve. Thank you very much. Elisa Stefano, please come on the stage. Daisy. So I think uh, what I find interesting from this last uh, discussion is that uh, when we start looking at the uh, climate change from a longer time frame, um, we start uh, introducing a new element inside the discussion, is what Jamer was saying, uh, this center the human uh, from design. So when we look at this process, at the climate changes of the process of the nature in, from a longer uh, point of view, we understand that we, we are less uh, positive on the role of design uh, on the, on, in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, on designing this process. If you look uh, at Wikipedia, uh, we can read that climate change is a change in the statistical disruption of weather patterns. Uh, when that the change lasts for the, uh, an extended period of time. Climate change is caused by factors such as bio, uh, uh, biotic processes, variation in solar radiation received by the earth, plate tectonics, and volcanic eruption. Certain human activities have been identified, uh, has been identified as primary causes of ongoing climate change, and often referred to as global warming. Uh, this, I think, brings us to uh, an interesting discussion that is 
I think contemporary, really actual. That is included, as uh, Elisa was saying, also a, politi a political element. And uh, if you look at what, for example, Trump is discussing now, uh, deciding to go out to all the worldwide uh, agreement on climate change, uh, we put, uh, we have to question ourselves how, uh, how important is the role of uh, human beings inside, inside this process. Stefan, I would like to start from you. You were speaking and uh, in, I mean, inserting back the idea of nature that take over uh, uh, human beings. So what do you think? It's a very complex discussion and very also political discussion in the contemporary age. I'll tell simply some, some issue. When it's, uh, for sure, we, we know that um, basically if we could gather all what is urban in one unique place, we will cover not more than 3% of the entire of the surface of the emerging land of the planet. But at the same time, we know that uh, this 3% is uh, producing the 75% of the CO2 which you in the atmosphere. Uh, so I, I think this is something that we absolutely should consider with attention. Uh, that's a one. Uh, another issue that what I was starting this morning presenting this, I mean, uh, putting uh, Peter Hoffman, this idea of technosphere. No? Technosphere is like an idea of a, of a potential extension of the urban uh, physical environment, thanks to all what is the technological networks, material and material that can cover an entire planet. And uh, uh, probably we should refer to that more than to an idea of kind of urban environment as simply a geographical or geometrical concentration of these spaces. Uh, but at the same time, uh, my point is that also when we think to the technosphere, we, uh, we are not seriously dealing with the notion of nature. So I was simply trying to, to uh, introduce a doubt of the fact that we continue, we continue also with the idea of technosphere to think to nature as something which is, in a way, outside, on the other side of what we can enterprise or culturally uh, define as part of our cultural sphere. That's the first point. The second point is about uh, the idea of decentralization. So in 2006, with Andrea Branzi, we were starting to imagine a project for the Grand Paris. And the idea was to imagine a kind of non-anthropocentric urban ethic. So to imagine a city where everything would be planned with an attempt to decentralize the, uh, let me say, the, 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 the paradigm of the design has a uh, main construction, something which is human construction. Uh, uh, we worked a lot on this concept in, in this year. And uh, finally, uh, it's a little bit stupid and banal, I still have that, but I think that the more we try to decentralize the more we are central. <laughs> this is stupid, but it's absolutely true. So the more we do our effort to try to imagine methodologies and practices that are trying to produce a process of change and transformation that are not directly produced by ourselves, the more we are making our attempt to control everything more sophisticated, but stronger and powerful. So we should never forget that. Mm. Never forget that we have to study how philosophy of so is talking about that. Thanks. Uh, another point, because I know that you have to, another question, because I know that you have to, to leave. Uh, but the last question to you is that, uh, as we often discuss, uh, nowadays we have uh, 40 million of uh, uh, immigrants around in the world, while in 2015 we expect uh, 200, uh, 2050 uh, million of uh, migrants. Uh, the, uh, caused by the climate change. Uh, so we have two movements inside the herd. We have uh, a movement of people from the countryside to the city, but also a movement from um, um, a different area of the, of the herd. So how uh, architecture uh, and uh, bringing back nature inside the cities can be a support of the quality of life and a better quality of life. Well, I think we have simply to design uh, and uh, 
project new informal settlements. Uh, it's pretty <laughs> paradoxical, but what we need is to uh, multiply the number of informal settlements. Nowadays, informal settlements are occupying basically the 3% of the surface of the urban environment all over the world. So the 33% of the population of our city is composed by favela slums from a settlement. It's not enough. We need more informal settlement. I know this is very, very, uh, well, it will be provoc provocative to, to feel that, but we should work in order to make the informal settlement that will the first place, the third place to host this uh, amazing flows of people that in the next year will abandon area of desertification, area where climate change will condition their life. And that we know that the unique way to absorb this flow is through the creation of better... But in the, man in the manifesto we wrote during San Paolo calling, there was a point saying that the informal settlements eat every part of the city, every part of nature. Informal settlements uh, use the, all the spaces of the of a city. Uh, and this is uh, going to bring us uh, to a city that without any piece of nature. Is it possible? Uh, I was just saying that that's a part of nature, first, so it's not... To, and because informal settlements are informal, they are, from a certain point of view, growing for a different, from a different party. It's not a party of control of urban planning. It's a totally another thing. It's more connected to the natural phenomena, and we should simply accept to host in our contemporary environment such kind of processes. So that's what I think. But uh, Thank I, I'm very sorry. I, I that's the reason I'm the president. Sometimes it's really bad. <laughs> sorry. Thank you so much. Ciao. I would like to go back to Elisa, and, uh, because uh, Elisa introduced uh, an element that is uh, the political dimension of geography. And uh, this is, I think, is really interesting because uh, for uh, making a better world, I would say, to, to uh, prevent some processes, to control some processes, we, uh, we need a very long time frame, while political uh, time frame is uh, uh, related to the five years election. So it's very difficult to plan, uh, to uh, prospect a, a, a solution for, for, some pro so for these processes. How can we do, what should we do? Um, we? We. Uh, as, is it working? Yeah. Um, we vote, we, so we are we part of politics. So we as governments, um, in, it's a very wide question, but um, what I would like to, to answer is that, uh, of course, when we are speaking about uh, problems that are um, issues that are, um, that has, have to be uh, globally understood and taken care of, um, we have to think about uh, um, governments uh, in uh, which uh, there are uh, civil servants, for example, that are independent from uh, the political uh, agenda and uh, that are uh, taking care of these global issues uh, without uh, um, considering uh, who is in power at the moment, at the power in, in, at the moment. Uh, and, uh, of course, there are also good examples uh, um, if we, uh, for example, think uh, uh, about um, recent projects uh, that um, started from the, the, the UK um, in terms uh, of um, open government platforms uh, and uh, um, digital platforms to provide services to, to the citizens um, because uh, they, they are uh, working in this way at the moment. So they have uh, independent offices that are taking care of the programs and uh, um, they do maintain their um, perspective and uh, uh, will of uh, reaching uh, some, some points. Um, other than the UK, uh, also other governments are following now the same uh, uh, path. And um, for example, um, 
Italy is uh, also one, uh, one of those. Um, and the, the US were uh, as well before uh, Trump jumping in the administration. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered, but um, I, I think there, uh, there must be um, parts uh, of governments in which uh, some issues uh, are um, discussed without uh, any implication uh, in, in politics, basically. Jimmer, you were speaking uh, before about, you said a museum doesn't last 2,000 years, uh, um, and, and so on and so on. No. Uh, but as, uh, um, as we discuss uh, before we call you, uh, the relationship between uh, humans and, and climate change and nature uh, is also related to hope. And we are in a, a moment in which uh, all the example of uh, uh, balena uh, blue waves or uh, stuff like that, uh, we realize that the younger generation are really living in a difficult moment because they are living without any perspective of the future. They live knowing that the, we are going to, towards a, a, the sixth extinction and, uh, and um, the, the ways in which pe before someone were, was killing himself for, because of family problem, of economic problems, now um, we are, this, I don't know, creating, a, not prospecting to the younger generation. How can we uh, conscient that we have to decentralize human from the design, but how can we take over the responsibility also of the younger generation building their own future? <laughs> that, uh, I have the answer. <laughs> Gosh, that's easy. Why did you know? Uh, it's the answer is four. Um, the, uh, no, I, well, first of all, as the father of a 20-year-old and an 18-year-old, um, they do not share that. Um, so uh, they certainly have hope, but of a different kind. They have a, they have a privileged form of hope uh, because they have uh, you know, resources and access to um, resources and to education and to opportunities. So um, certainly there are lots of people uh, living without a sense of hope. There's no question about that, young and old. Um, that said, uh, I am not a catastrophist. Um, I don't think that um, we sort of benefit uh, from the alarmism around things. I think that we as humans survive. We are resilient. Um, we may survive in many fewer numbers. Uh, we may have massive uh, depopulation. Um, I mean, there are lots of very scary uh, futures that we may experience, but um, you know, I think there will be a kind of homeostasis that will come about. And I also think that uh, we, you know, if you look historically at human civilization, we go through lots of moments of escalating fears of the future, um, and that we model through. Um, and this one may be out of our control more than others, but most of them that we posit uh, apocalyptically are out of our control. That's why we create them <laughs> as fears. Um, so I'm not denying climate change. I don't want to be interpreted as someone denying climate change. On the other hand, um, we will figure this out. The problem is, um, just as William Gibson said, the future uh, you know, is here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, hope is here. It's just unevenly distributed. And there may not be that many people who can have hope uh, it may take a different form of hope. Um, but some of those forms may be um, ecstatic and may be wonderful and may be strange and may be unexpected and may be unknown. Um, and so I guess as a generally hopeful person, um, I feel like we will somehow figure out a way through this, um, but it will require radical reconfigurations of what we consider to be normal. Um, and that may be... Um, that may be an extraordinary thing. Um, living without an automobile, automobile, for instance, which many people in the world do, um, for me would be a great luxury. Um, and so, you know, maybe there are ways in which we can transform our understanding of uh, living without, of privation, of, um, of how we live together, 
that will seem um, surprisingly hopeful um, when we face the reality of what we've done. Daisy. <laughs> Thanks for solving that. Yeah. Is there a god? <laughs> Four. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, you were uh, speaking about synthetic biology uh, like an um, evolutionary process. Uh, also, Marina Otero was before discussing of speaking of the landscape as a uh, uh, as a dominated by technology. Um, so my question is: uh, Is technology um, uh, taking over a human being, or is technology part of the evolutionary process, Darwinistic evolutionary process in which technology? Uh, is entering inside uh, our body, our daily life. Uh, I mean, I'm of the camp that believes that we create technology. So um, it is a, t a social tool that we embed our politics and values and beliefs into it to do things. And um, you know, the current sort of, I mean, maybe I'll stick to synthetic biology rather than delving into the <laughs> Facebook and all the other kind of um, technological mishaps that we're experiencing. Um, it, synthetic biology has always fascinated me since I first learned about it 10 years ago because it was such a um, space of ideological sort of, uh, you know, engineers were coming into biology and saying we can do this better than people who've done it before. And those people were biologists and um, other people using genetic engineering and prior to that breeding technologies to change nature to our desires, and I think that um, what is particularly interesting about synthetic biology and the potential convergence with AI and other kinds of advanced computation is that we won't be able to keep up with the technology that we make, and by keeping up I mean decide if we want it, and the impulse is to make those technologies and then decide, and I've often encountered in synthetic biology policy meetings sort of um, people whose responsibility is to um, sort of lead uh, sort of vision-making exercises saying, well, um, you know, we should make, we make the technology and then we decide. We don't decide and then make the technology. But as soon as we have the technology, then we use it anyway because it's very hard to stop. And so there seems to be a sense of, well, the technology is leading and we're not actually in control. But I think <laughs> absolutely we need to reclaim the control over it because we choose what we make. So the kinds of things that are proliferating now from um, genetically, and you know, there's a sort of uh, a scale of interactions from, you know, should we engineer plants? But well, we're already doing that. Should we engineer bacteria that interact with plants so that you can improve nitrogen fixing? Well, that means releasing engineered bacteria into the soil, um, as well as engineered plants. To should we release engineered viruses into people? Um, to try and sort of cure lung disease, or that's already happening in trials in China, to should we engineer the germline of humans. Um, so these are all conscious decisions that we make, and the problem is, is that we make them in different places, and different countries have different levels of control. Um, so I think we absolutely need to take back the, the claim of control over these things, and I take back control is not a good metaphor, but in this case, <laughs> um, it is one, because we make technology, and we choose what we make. Uh, another question. Um, at the beginning of internet, in particular, that I, uh, I would consider uh, like uh, the beginning of a big diffusion of technology in our daily life, uh, image was, the image was used as the uh, dominant tool, I would say. No? Uh, but from the last, in the last year now, we are moving to other senses. Uh, for example, we use sound, uh, we speak to our phone, we speak to Alexia, uh, and as we saw from your project, we, uh, technology is also starting creating smell, uh, and so we are trying to, uh, because in some way the images are uh, like if, um, a reproduction, while it, it seems that we are trying to uh, make uh, technology more natural. Mm. Is it true? 
Uh, perhaps. I mean, what we're trying to do in this project is there are other elements to it which I haven't spoken about, but we are trying to play with this idea of representation. So the, the, the artists and who are painting these sort of grand paintings of the sublime, of you know, the experience of the avalanche in the Alps, we're trying to evoke um, their audience and to provoke that same sensation. And so there are other, um, and I think that's a very artificial thing. Um, trying to, you know, trying to press the button and make you feel something. But I think it's a really interesting um, device to play with. So while we try and make our technologies seem more seamless and things like synthetic biology will make our technologies part of us, so whether engineering ourselves or engineering our bacteria in our bodies that it may feel like us, um, I think there's sort of two elements. One is, yes, they will be part of us, but these environments are already part of us and so this idea of the hollow bion is very important that um, uh, Scott Gilbert who's a biologist talks about himself as team Scott Gilbert and I think it's such a nice idea that he is a mass of bacteria and others and human cells that is coordinated into the effort of presenting himself as Scott Gilbert in the same way I'm team Daisy um, and I really like that idea that these so the integration of these technologies but at the same time we need to decide which bits of our, our, identity, our identity we claim in that. So, you know, if it is a corporately owned bacteria, how much of that, when it becomes part of us, do we own? Um, where do our boundaries lie um, in terms of ourselves? I think it's going to be a problem to, to kind of navigate. I would, uh, I don't know if there, is a, there are some questions from the, from the public. Anyway, um, I have another, I, because Jamer, I have a problem because when I read about you, I was expecting, uh, no, because for example, on your project on uh, design and violence, I was expecting that put the, that explore the relationship between creation, destruction, design, and everyday experience. I was expecting, uh, 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 I would say, a negative, uh, 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 point of view, I don't know, a destructive point of view, uh, putting the reflecting on the role of violence inside the, uh, of climate change, while well, you are so positive. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a small town. <laughs> so, you know, uh, small town values. Uh, no, I don't, uh, I think what, um, when Paola and I did design and violence, um, that was uh, simply, I mean, and, and Paola can describe her feelings about it, but in my role, uh, or the, part of the reason I was so excited to be invited to participate was, was that um, we had uh, an opportunity to change the conversation in design. Um, I had been to so many events, and I'm sure others have, uh, where designers talk about uh, improving the world, making a better world. I mean, everything that, that Daisy's whole project is about, about better, the design plays a role in it. Um, that's so patently false uh, about what designers do. Sure, they make some things better, but they also make some things worse. And um, it seemed to me, just as in uh, public health, uh, where we have a robust and mature conversation about the ways in which interventions in healthcare can cause positive impacts and negative impacts, and we measure them and we decide and we make collective decisions in the best interest of human public health, um, that in design we never have those conversations. We were afraid to have those conversations as if somehow in criticizing design we were going to destroy it. And it would, you know, just when it was getting to be popular, we were going to undermine it by having it. Whereas my feeling was just the opposite. If we're going to be a resilient uh, profession, then we need to be able to have these difficult conversations about the ways in which design both creates and destroys at the same time. And um, I don't, you know, um, and I think one of the things that was super important to me, and I think Paula shared this as well, was we also didn't want to be in the position of being judgmental. Um, that's an easy position to take, and I think it's an um, a irresponsible position to take. Our, our goal was to try and um, catalyze a conversation amongst a group of people. So what you saw was that it was, it was almost never Paula's voice or my voice in any of that project. It was the voice of people we invited in, over whom we had no editorial control to say whatever they wanted about projects that we had curated. Um, and so, and then to open it up to others to contribute to that conversation through the threaded conversations online. And so the idea was to use it to um, catalyze a conversation within the, 
And the field justice broken nature, I think, will be an opportunity for to, to catalyze a conversation. And I see that as a hopeful thing. Um, I see that as a way in which the design profession can uh, increase its level of professional maturity and take seriously the impact it has on, its, on the world, rather than just having this fantasy that because we have good intentions, we are doing good things. We were never saying designers were bad people, but the actions of designers have repercussions that we have to be accountable for, responsible for, and we have to understand. And in public health, they measure it. Um, in other fields, they measure impact. Um, and so I think it was a very simple gesture um, to bring a, a conversation into the domain in the same way that Daisy's projects do, that Elisa's projects do, I think is just ways of um, raising the stakes in design and, and really taking accountability for the impact that we have, both positive and negative. Thank you. I think we have to close the discussion. Thank you very much, Paola, for inviting us, and thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you. You can stay on stage or you can get off whatever you prefer. I'm just like, yeah, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you be free. Thank you so much, thank Lorenzo, you, for moderating this panel, and thank you all. As you can tell, it's really, uh, as Jamer said, about catalyzing the conversation, about getting everybody to discuss. Um, you know, these big questions, who is it for, what is better, what is nature, will not be answered by the 22nd Triennale, nor will they be answered by other exhibitions and other projects. It's going to be a collective effort. I really love the idea of human beings being a team of bacteria, so this is Team Paola, and so there's the team of the team of the team. And it's only by discussing all together that we'll be able to do something, or at least be uh, not be dissatisfied with ourselves. And this triennale, you know, there are two people that I have not introduced to you yet. There are Laura Agnesi and Marco San Michele. I don't know if Marco is still here, but they are working, uh, trying to harness international participations. You know, part of the triennale will be all of these participations that will address the topic from different perspectives in different parts of the world. Some we already know what they will be, others we don't know yet, but it's fascinating to see how the response responses are at the same time varied and pertinent. It's really amazing. But um, whenever we uh, start a project, you know, with Ala, with Jamer, with Daisy, with Adam, it always starts as a big idea that then gets shaped by both the projects that we encounter and the voices that we listen to. And every time we have the opportunity and the privilege to have a conversation like the one that we had today, our project gets better and more precise. So if you want to have any closing remarks, the closing remarks are thank you very much to the speakers and thank you very much to you that have come here and stayed with us the whole day. It was a heavy day. I'm sure it was exciting and inspiring, but I'm not going to underestimate the fatigue and the effort that it took you to be with us until this time. And so Ala and Laura and Azura and I would like to really, really thank you because you really increased the uh, knowledge of the curatorial team. The speakers have been fantastic. and. Uh, we owe you a lot. Many of them are also on the advisory committee, so they will be with us throughout. So we really, really thank you all. Um, and uh, we will be in touch soon to share more with you. And you know, right now there's going to be a reception in the garden for everyone. And then at 7.30, if you can come back here, there's going to be Fabrizio Terranova's documentary about Donna Haraway, which is a real treat because it's not one that you can find elsewhere. It's a feature film, so maybe you go have a pizza beforehand because it's going to be until 9 o'clock. But if you have the time to come back, it's really worthwhile. And uh, in the meantime, I hope to see you all in the garden. I thank everyone that's been online. I thank the team here, um, that the audiovisuals team of the theater, and I thank very much uh, Stefano Boeri, the president of the Triennale, Carlo Morfini, who's the director of the Triennale, and then the wonderful uh, Triennale team that's working with us. Thank you very much.